All right, so let's look at some of the exercises um, on the mean value theorem. Um, so we're asked a couple of things here uh, for these three questions. First, to determine if the mean value theorem even holds. Uh, and if it did, does, then find a value of C inside our, our open interval, of which shows the mean value of variables, like where it exists. So first function we have here is a quadratic polynomial on a closed interval. So um, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it before, but one thing we can kind of rely on is that polynomials are going to be continuous everywhere. So maybe I should back up a little bit. What are our conditions for the mean value theorem? And there are two of them. One is that F is continuous on some closed interval, not of, on, some closed interval AB. So we're checking that off. We have it's a polynomial, which means they're continuous uh, everywhere, including on this interval. Next condition is what? F is differentiable on a slightly smaller interval, the open interval A and B. Um, is that true? I don't know. Let's find the derivative. What is F prime of X? That is equal to 2X plus 3. So 2X plus 3, that is another polynomial. And if the derivative is continuous everywhere, among other things, that means the derivative is defined everywhere, including on this interval. So I have a checkbox or a check here too. So the multiple, the mean value theorem has to apply because both of these conditions are met. So now we have to think about this, where, like what is the value of C? So I'll back up again. These right here are the conditions. Um, of the mean value theorem. So what's the result? So what do you get if these conditions are met? Well, then there is some value C on the open interval. Uh, uh, that's not probably not the way you're used to looking at it. There is a C such that um, C is strictly between A and B. So it cannot be, C cannot be equal to A or B. It'll be strictly between them. There is a C such that um, C is between A and B and F prime of C is equal to this, F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Or when I was just going through many of your exit tickets just now, uh, language you used a lot was that basically, if you have a function that's continuous and differentiable on the interval in the way that it needs to be, then there has to be a point where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. So basically, there is a single point that has the same slope as the function does over the entire interval. So basically, we're being asked now to find that point. So first, we should do this. We should find the average rate of change over this interval. So what is f of a and f of b? In our case, that's f of negative 2 and f of 2. So f of negative 2 is negative 2 squared plus 3 times negative 2 minus 1. So 4 minus 6 minus 1 is minus 3. And what is f of 2? f of 2 is equal to... 2 squared plus 3 times 2 minus 1. So 4 plus 6 minus 1, I believe that's 9. And just because I'm paranoid, let me look for errors. 4 minus 6. Yeah, okay. So now we can find the average rate of change. The average rate of change will be equal to f of b minus f of a over B minus A, so 9 minus negative 3 over 2 minus negative 2, so 12 over 4 
So the average rate of change over the interval is three, which means the mean value theorem guarantees that there's at least one point where the derivative is equal to three. So the derivative of C is equal to 2C plus three, and there has to be a point where that's equal to three. So if we solve this equation, we get 2C equals zero or C equals zero. So here's the value of C. Uh, we have shown that the mean value theorem holds the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line for this interval is three. There's also a single point on this function where the derivative is equal to three, and that's at x equals zero. So moving on to 13 here. Um, so again, first, let's check the conditions. So do I have continuity on zero, three? Do I have a differentiability on the open interval, zero, three? So square root functions, so we have to be a little more careful because there are places where the square root function is um, not continuous. Um, and those are going to be the places where it's not defined. So first thing we want to figure out is, is this thing defined on zero, three? Um, I believe it is because, well, let's check the endpoints first. If I plug in zero for X, I get the square root of nine, that's three. And if I plug in three, I get nine minus nine, which is zero. The square root of zero is defined. Um, so I have continuity. It's going to be defined everywhere between zero and three. Um, where's it going to be? And let's just look at this uh, one more way. Where's it going to fail to be defined? It's going to be where I'm taking the square root of negative numbers. So what's going to cause me to take the square root of negative numbers is if X is any bigger than three. So I'm not really worried about that because I have, um, the interval I care about is covered. Now we want to know about differentiability. So let's do this. Let's take the derivative. And we have a square root. So before I do that, let me rewrite as 9 minus x squared to the half power. Uh, taking the derivative of this is going to require chain rule. So our outside function is basically something raised to the 1 half. What is the derivative of something raised to the 1 half? Uh, power rule tells us it's 1 half times the something. 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. Um, but I'm not taking the derivative of this with respect to that function. I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to x. So I have to multiply this by the derivative of the inside, which is negative 2x. So all told, I get what? The 1 half and the 2 will cancel. So I'll get negative x over the square root of 9 minus x squared. So it looks like we have a problem because our interval is 0, 3. But if I let x equal 3, then what's my derivative going to be? My derivative is going to be undefined because I'm going to divide by 0. It's actually not a problem because I don't need this to be uh, differentiable at, at x equals 3. I just need to be differentiable um, on the open interval. I don't, I don't need to include 3. Um, this derivative will be defined everywhere between zero and three, as long as I don't include the endpoints. So I get these, I, I have the conditions, they're met, which means the mean value theorem has to hold. So now I need to look for what that is. So, so we know what our target is. Let's look at the average rate of change. That's going to be F of three minus F of zero over three minus zero. What is f of 3? If I plug in 3 for x, I get 9 minus 9, 0. Square root of 0 is 0. f of 0, I get 9 minus 0, 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So 0 minus 3 over 3 minus 0. That gives me negative 1. So there must be a place where the derivative is equal to negative 1 on my open interval. So Let's set up this equation. Negative x over radical 9 minus x squared equals negative 1. I would like to multiply both sides by negative 1. I would also like to clear the fraction. So I'll multiply both sides by the denominator, and I get x equals radical 
9 minus x squared. Uh, next, I would like to clear the radical. So I will square both sides. And that gives me x squared equals 9 minus x squared. Um, I would like to combine variables or combine unknowns on the same side. So I get 2x squared equals 9. Then I'll divide by 2. So x squared equals 9 halves. And then finally, that gives me x values of what? Plus or minus 3 over radical 2. Um, so the mean value theorem guarantees me one value. There's no reason it can't be more than one, but do I actually have more than one value here? I really don't because, uh, let me unpack this a little bit more. I have three, two values, 3 over radical 2 and negative 3 over radical 2. Um, mean value theorem guarantees that I have a point where the derivative matches the average rate of change, but that point must be inside the interval. This negative number is not. So the value of C that meets or that you know fulfills the mean value theorem is 3 over radical 2. And finally, question 16. All right, so natural log. Um, so let's write, remind ourselves of our conditions again. Continuous on the closed interval 1, 5, and differentiable on the open interval 1, 5. Is this continuous on 1, 5? So natural log function is, it's continuous wherever it's defined. So basically it's continuous over its whole domain. So where is the domain of the natural log? Um, so natural log is not defined on any negative number, and it's also not defined on zero. It's defined everywhere else. Uh, our interval 1, 5 is made entirely of positive numbers, so I have continuity. So I have differentiability. I don't know. What is f prime of x? f prime of x is equal to 1 over x. Where is 1 over x going to be? Um, so differentiability is where the derivative exists. So in other words, where the derivative is going to be defined. Where is 1 over x going to be undefined? That's only going to happen where x equals 0. But I don't care about that. x equals 0 is not, is not anywhere on this interval. So I have continuity. I have differentiability, which means the mean value theorem applies. So I'm looking for that magical value C. So let's look at the average rate of change over this interval. So what is the rise F minus five or F of five minus F of one over the run five minus one. So this is natural log of five minus the natural log of one over four, natural log of one is zero. So my average rate of change is one fourth times the natural log of five, which if you want, you can approximate. I am going to try to do this exactly. Um, so this is my average rate of change, one fourth natural log of five, which means there must be a place where the derivative equals one fourth natural log of five. So one over X equals Now might be a good time to write like this, natural log of five over four. If um, I'm trying to solve this for X, a couple ways to look at this. One's a little faster, but it might be a little harder to follow, but I'm trying to solve for X. One over X is the reciprocal of X. Um, what's the reciprocal of X, or sorry, what's the reciprocal of one over X? That's going to be the reciprocal of this right-hand side, which will be 4 over natural log of 5. So, again, that's... That might be a little hand-wavy, a little mystical. Um, so I'll, I'll explain it a, a different way that hopefully is more convincing. Um, let's say that this reciprocal thing didn't, didn't make a ton of sense to you. Something we can also do is this. Um, we can just clear all the fractions out and hopefully it'd be easier to solve for X. Um, 
if I multiply both sides by x here, I get 1 equals x natural log of 5 over 4. Then if I multiply both sides by 4, I get 4 equals x natural log of 5. And then from here, I can divide both sides by natural log of 5. And I got x equals 4 divided by the natural log of 5. So whichever way you get there, um, that's fine. And for good measure, maybe you approximated this a long time ago. So let's do that now. 4 divided by the natural log of 5 is about 2.485. All right.